This episode is proudly supported by Pepe Sayer Australian Cultured Butter, batch churned from single origin cream. We've got a culturing process, a fermenting process, an aging process. So the butter will taste very different than, I guess, the average supermarket butter. Uh, I like to say we make butter makers butter. Like this is the sort of butter butter makers will would like to eat simply because of the slow process in which we ferment and age and, and get the flavour into it. You know, the natural fermentation that gets all the flavours into the cream and then once you churn it, you end up with this really rich, flavoursome butter that evolves and changes because it's a live culture that's in the butter as well. For more information, go to pepisaya.com.au. I'm absolutely convinced that, that chefs and restaurateurs and consumers want to know more about the source of supply, the provenance, the history, um, and, and, and the back catalogue story. And I think that, you know, the seafood industry have got so many really amazing and exciting stories to tell. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. As the sun of summer warms our backs and we dive headfirst into the festive season, there are few things that celebrate the joy of both than seafood. As we launch into Christmas with renewed optimism, who better to plumb the depths and discover the bounty than one of the world's leading authorities on seafood, John Sussman. John, how are you, mate? Jeez, Huck, I'm a bit nervous after that introduction. <laughs> well, you're my go-to guide for seafood, and you always have been. Uh, summer is a real celebration of seafood, even though there's amazing species available in winter and in other seasons. But what is it about seafood and summer? Well, I, I kind of reflect on the fact that that you know, summer, a lot of people are by the seaside, and seaside speaks seafood. It's, um, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to sell a steak by the sea, I reckon, but it's pretty easy to sell a prawn. And um, so I think we have this sort of this ingrained sort of expectation that summer is all about seafood. But as you just mentioned, I mean, more often than not, the, uh, the winter fish and the winter crustacea are actually you know, carrying more fat and generally tastier. But, you know, hey, I'm not trying to you know, tip iced water on the summer of seafood. I'm just saying that it... <laughs> It uh, it does tend to sort of coincide with the fact that a lot of people migrate to the ocean and um, or you know sitting on the beach and they want to have a prawn sandwich. So um, you know, yeah, let's uh, let's run with it anyway. Well, <laughs> let's talk about summer for a little bit. What, what are the species that you know really stand out for you during summer? Yeah, look, I think it's 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 one of those things where Christmas everyone sort of expects you know prawns, lobsters, and oysters, and yet look, there are you know good plenty of prawns, lobsters, and oysters around over the over the summer period, and and I think um, you know let's start with those. Let's think about the fact that the the rock oyster in particular, from the uh, basically the mid north coast upwards to the border is in peak condition over over the summer and there's still southern oysters from the south coast of New South Wales around at that time but certainly from you know rains aside the uh, the oysters from from basically you know sort of um, lemon tree passage through to the Tweed River are all in outstanding condition over the summer and and it's such great eating and and as we've seen over the last few years there's been this sort of renaissance of appreciation for for rock oysters in particular, I think that that's um, that's exciting, and so I, I I try and eat my body weight in in rock oysters over the summer period, and and then sort of look to uh, look to autumn to try and drop a bit of weight. But no, <laughs> <laughs> tell, tell us a bit about the rock oyster. Do you have any yarns of your experiences with it? Because it is an extraordinary oyster. Well, it is, and 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 there's so much Australian, I guess you know, seafood history tied up with uh, with rock oysters i mean it you know it's a an aquaculture industry that's been around for at least 6000 years that, that we believe with the various middens that are found up and down the coastline um, you know it is a really unique oyster it's only found on the 1500 kilometers of coastline here on the east coast of australia it's endemic to our to our waters um, and it truly does have a a really unique reflection of what is, you know, sort of uh, termed as the mahoir or mehoir, um, with, you know, individual estuaries reflecting flavour and texture that are different to the next. 
So, you know, I, I, I truly believe that it's, it's such a, an amazing, uh, exciting and enjoyable shellfish that it, 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 you know, every oyster is different and every oyster gives you a different experience. And I think it's one of those things that, that we should be really proud of. I mean, people often forget that this is a, this is a native food. And, um, you know, just because it's not necessarily foraged, it, it doesn't mean that it's not sort of worthy of, of a reputation of being a truly great Indigenous food. Um, it's, it's often thought of as a lux, luxury food and a celebratory food. Um, do you have any yarns of, you know, your favourite experiences that you've had with oysters? Look, I've, had, I've, I've been lucky enough to, to be part of the Royal Agricultural Society's aquaculture competition for over 20 years and and um, it never fails to um, amaze me just how much enthusiasm, skill and absolute passion, and I know that that can be a bit of a hackneyed cliche in our caper, but, you know, there is this sort of level of commitment from rock oyster farmers in particular, that I reckon is very endearing and, and, and real. And, you know, you speak with the likes of Robbie Moxham on the Hawkesbury River, you know, fifth generation oyster farmer that has had a you know, severe run of outs over the last 15 years with various oyster diseases and floods and so forth. And you still get this underlying sense of absolute love and commitment to the species and it's it's just so endearing it's 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 really exciting and you know then there's the next generation of oyster farmers that are coming through young guys that are looking at different techniques and technologies um looking at different husbandries that are you know sort of setting this next wave of of uh of production that is at the highest level by any world standard you know it's it, that's what's so exciting about it um, the days of, of you know, the all you can eat for nine ninety nine oyster buffet at the Root Hill RSL are um, quite frankly, thankfully behind us because, you know, I, I, I think that the commoditization of a luxury food is always dangerous. Um, you know, much as the, you know, Angus burger or Wagyu burger can sort of, I guess, undermine the status of, of you know, a luxury food. So too those you know nasty days of the eighties with those cheap oysters, uh, thankfully behind us, and um, you know we now have this sort of really, really exciting next generation of, of oyster appreciation, driven in part by the value. Um, you know it's not uncommon to see an oyster at you know four, five, six dollars a piece in a restaurant. Um, which on a you know pro rata dollars per gram of protein makes them amongst the most expensive on the planet. Um, but with that comes an expectation from both the grower and the merchant and the consumer that, you know, you're working in the luxury food world. So we've seen this incredible change. And as I referred to before, the RAS show has, I believe, very much assisted in, in stewarding the level of excellence in, in quality and um, you know we're seeing some we're seeing a much higher quality of, of of oysters come to market than certainly what I first saw thirty years ago, um, and I think that that's one of the exciting things. So you know, getting back to the original question, what I love about summer and seafood is is the rock oysters are something that I just think are are an absolute standout um, uh, for both you know sort of my personal enjoyment, but also from a commercial perspective, I think it's a great time for us to really be celebrating one of the great seafoods in Australia. You mentioned prawns a bit earlier as well, and a lot of people buy prawns uh, during summer. What, what's so special about Australian prawns? Yeah, look, it's a, it's, it's a good point. I mean, I think we kind of have taken prawns for granted so much in this country. I mean, you know, I think, I guess when... Hogan first threw that shrimp on the barbie for Tourism Australia, whatever it was, 20-odd years ago. Um, he probably didn't realise that he'd put the flame to the touch paper of appreciation for Australian prawns. But what we – yeah, I mean, we do have a very, very special resource. I mean, we've got, you know, a wild capture industry that operates in sort of, you know, a dozen different, you know, sort of regions around Australia with, you know, seven or eight core species. 
of wild catch prawn from you know prawns that are caught on the you know Hawkesbury River, the you know local schoolies, the Dreesybacks, all the way through to the amazing sort of deep water scarlet prawns off the east coast and the and the tiger prawns from the Gulf of Carpentaria. Um, you know, I, I speak to chums in the seafood business in Europe and, and North America, and and they're amazed at, at you know relatively how inexpensive our wild caught prawns are. And, and and the other thing to consider as well is that our, our wild capture prawn fisheries are so well managed, um, and and valuable and so valuable that you know we can be really proud of what is what is caught here in Australia. And and I guess to that to that extent of also what's what's growing. I mean we've got a a burgeoning you know farming prawn farming industry that is amongst the world's best in terms of its sustainability practices, in terms of the quality that is produced. Um, and in terms of the consistency, uh, and of course, you know, underlying all of that is is, is safety, and, and that's both in wild catch in terms of the safety for the fishermen, and um, and food safety in 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 farm prawns. So, when it comes to celebrating wild caught prawns, uh, do you have any tips or advice on on you know when you're purchasing them and what to do with them? Yeah, look, I think um, we need to really reflect on on how they're caught, when they're caught and where they're caught. And I think for a long time, certainly in the early part of my career uh, in seafood, you know, there was this presumption or perception that they had to be fresh. Um, these days, I'm inclined really to focus on frozen and, and from a number of different angles. I mean, you know, a prawn is a highly fragile uh, animal from a, from a sort of a, a quality re- retention perspective. It uh, it oxidises naturally very quickly when it's out of out of water, um, and the historical way to deal with that was to treat them with sodium metabisulfate or an antioxidant um, ingredient, which you know uh, can variously have an impact on flavour and texture of a of a prawn. These days, the pres- <coughs> excuse me, these days the preservation method of choice, well, at least for me, is for um, for the prawn to be frozen as quickly uh, after harvest as possible. And I think that, um, you know, from for, certainly for the wild prawn perspective, I would much rather see that, uh, that quality be captured through contemporary freezing technology as quickly as possible and shipped to market, you know, in an appropriate manner um, such that it's you know quality is preserved um, right through to the point of consumption. So you know my my gen- unless you're lucky enough to live in one of the northern rivers you know ports such as you know Coffs Harbour or or, or Ballina or or on the on the Clarence River in Eluca, um, you know the opportunity to actually access a fresh wild prawn is pretty limited. You know maybe sometimes out of Lakes Entrance in 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 uh, East Gippsland in Victoria. Um, maybe sometimes in in northwest Western Australia, but the opportunity to access a truly fresh wild prawn is is pretty limited. And I think if you have an expectation for it to be fresh, then you're probably really missing the point. I'd I'd, I'd rather see people recognise that this contemporary freezing technology is without peer um, in terms of the preservation of the inte- culinary integrity. And the other element to that is, I mean, we all talk sustainability, but um, you know, air freighting fresh shellfish around the country um, clearly comes, you know, at a at a cost for, to the environment that is way beyond that if it was if it was preserved on the vessel and and uh, and road freighted in bulk. So you know, there's a couple of different things that need to be considered there, and you know, certainly with freezing. The ability to manage that quality of inventory, whether it's in your freezer at the restaurant or, or at home, um, or whether it's in a cold store or whether it's on a vessel, is is so much greater. There's so many different prawns in Australia, but do you have any sort of go-to cooking moves when you buy, purchase prawns? Well, I mean, I, I do love the variety that we have. I mean, the flavours and textures of wild prawns vary so dramatically from, from as we mentioned before, the school prawn through to the tiger prawn, the banana prawn, the endeavour prawn, 
you know, the the deep water scarlet prawns. I mean, I think the royal red prawn, which is another deep water prawn, has got a great future um, in terms of being able to provide, um, you know, a, an option for a wild caught prawn. And I do think that, you know, we, we will see wild prawns um, find their natural status as, as being the super premium shellfish in this country over the next few years. I mean, you know, it's something to consider are the, uh, the quotas that are being reduced around the country. And, um, and you know, I think we're going to start to see recognition for just what great value the wild prawns offer here here in Australia. In terms of preparation, as I said, I, my, prep, my preference is to these days be, be buying a, you know, a, a, a frozen prawn with a, with a known provenance, a known history. Um, you know, we're seeing various fishing companies now putting, you know, brands around their prawns. And, you know, that's not just for the purposes of, of, of marketing alone. It's, it's for that, you know, sort of giving, a, you know, the level of protection to the, to the buyer. Um, you know, a Skull Island tiger prawn comes with a huge history um, in terms of, you know, the quality uh, of both the fishing and, and the uh, packing and the, and the grading. Um, and I think that that's worth celebrating. For, for me, prawns deserve, you know, a really simple preparation. I mean, you know, great prawns have incredible flavour and texture. And they vary so much in terms of those flavours and textures. I personally like to to eat them in as simple a form as possible, so that I can actually experience that flavour and texture differentiation. Um, you know, something simply grilled or, or steamed is 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 always a treat for me. What are some other species people should be focusing on over the Christmas sort of summer period? Well, I guess you know we always like to think about about crabs as well, and um, you know, interestingly enough, I mean, we do again have incredibly good value wild caught crabs in this country, um, from mud crab, you know, spanner crab, blue swimmer crab, two spot sand crab, deep water crabs from the southwest of Western Australia. We've got a broad variety and range of of, of crab that comes to market. Um, and, and again, whilst um, summer tends to be a, um, a slightly lesser harvesting period, the quality of the crabs that come through, particularly from northern Australia um, over the summer period, you know, it gives us some great choice. And again, I wouldn't be scared of actually buying a, um, you know, a frozen crab. In fact, to be quite frank, I, you know, unless it's, unless it's a, you know, a feisty live mud crab that can hold well out of water. I mean, my preference would be to be buying a frozen, a frozen crab that has been, uh, you know, frozen quickly as close to point of harvest, uh, both in, in distance and time as possible. Um, and, and, you know, there are some, there are some really good, you know, crab products available now, not just whole, but, you know, sort of some processed meat and so forth. I think that there's, there's, there's great product available here in Australia and, and such incredibly good value. Um, again, by any measure, we've got to be proud of, of, of what we have. What's the go-to John Sussman crab dish that you can share? Uh, look, you know, having, having said that I'm, I'm a big supporter of frozen crab, my, my go-to John Sussman crab dish is with my feet in the Wallace Lake, <laughs> um, hand peeling a freshly caught, freshly cooked, you know, blue from a crab, um, sl- you, know, s- you know, peeling the, peeling the meat out, whacking it between two slices of, um, of white death bread that's smothered in butter. <laughs> With a with a with a grind of black pepper and a, and just a, the slightest uh, hint of lemon juice, I think that's pretty hard to beat. <laughs> Most people, as you mentioned, sort of go to prawns, lobsters, oysters, and even crabs during this period of time. But there's some amazing fish around as well during summer that probably aren't heroed as much. Is are there some that stand out for you? Look, absolutely, Huck. I think I think one of the one of the things, and particularly Christmas Christmas week. I mean, um, you know. <laughs> People almost forget about fish at Christmas time, which is which is really quite surreal because you know some of some of the bargains, uh, certainly the Christmas bargains, are available in, in in whole fish. I mean, the New Zealand quota quota season that opens basically in October sees you know a lot of whole fish out of New Zealand, ranging from you know the big deep water fish like you know harpooka 
Bass Groper, Blue Eye, Imperato, Alfonsino, all the way through to you know the snappers and the and the brims and the and the um, and the Jewfish um, from the local waters. And there's plenty of good whole whole fish, and they are just terrific for for cooking on the bone and and that sort of relaxed summer eating of of you know of peeling you know juicy flesh off the bone. I reckon is an absolute treat. One of the things that is probably worth considering in terms of something to just be wary of is that we don't have a lot of tuna during our during our summer season. So um, you know everyone loves to think that they can throw a tuna steak on the barbie, which you know of itself I think is a bit of a you know a bit of a heresy anyway but um, <laughs> but there's not a lot of tuna around during our summer and what is around tends to be relatively low in fat and and you know of mixed mixed quality um, but having said that there's good you know good supply of swordfish and and that is something that on a gentle barbecue not a not a high ferocious heat barbecue but a gentle barbecue you know marinated in olive oil with some some rosemary and some lemon zest and some garlic is, I think, is an absolute treat. And again, you know, insane, insane value by comparison to what you would pay for the same species in North America or Europe. So, swordfish in summer, I think, are are, are, are great partners. Um, your father, Dave Sussman, was renowned for fishing. Do you have any stories of when you were young and um, the catches and feasts that you had? Yeah, I mean, Dave Sussman was somewhere between Indiana Jones and Keith Floyd as a, as a character. Um, generally, not far from a glass of wine or or a cold beer, and and always, you know, with a line in his hand or thinking about the next the next opportunity to fish. And you know, we had summers crabbing for for uh, blue swimmer crabs in the Spencer Gulf and St Vincent's Gulf in South Australia, or up at Loch Nine on the on the River Murray, you know, hunting down the mighty Murray cod during you know Easter, and um, he'd even have his you know his, he'd have a crack at prawning. I'll never forget one one time. <laughs> we're we're out in the St Vincent Gulf with a uh, on a fifteen foot Quintrex with a sort of thirty five horsepower Johnson on the back, and the old man had had begged borrowed or stole and a, a literally a prawn trawler from I think might, might have been from George Raptus and and you know struggled out to the fishing grounds he's throwing this thing over the side and sank the boat um, <laughs> which you know <laughs> was pretty funny as an eight-year-old with a with a safety safety vest on but uh, <laughs> it was something else but certainly I mean and I do one of the one of the species that I reflect on that 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 Dave and his mates used to used to catch was the was the wild Murray cod. Um, you know, I know Murray cod's become a very fashionable uh, aqua, aquaculture species these days. But um, you know, those big old large Murray cod, uh, wild Murray cod that were wily as all get out, and in fact were were probably one of the one of the most difficult um, you know difficult fish to catch. Um, you know, and the old man and his mates would spend literally weeks hunting, you know, stalking one one fish, um, and you know they'd, they'd land these things and they'd be thirty, forty, fifty kilos, um, but just amazing fish. I mean, the flavour and texture I can still recall of of the wild Murray cod, and that's certainly something that um, you know mythology has kept that. That uh, that alive for a long time, but it was just a, such a unique fish. In fact, I've got a, I've got a photo of the old man and one of his mates with a, uh, a sixty five kilo Murray cod that they'd caught on the uh, the Anna branch of the Murray um, above my bed, and uh, <laughs> d- just reminds me of just how special that, that that fishing was. It was incredible, incredible, and it was you know just speaking of that. I mean, I, I've also got another another time where I I, I was sitting in the back of the old man's ute drinking a you know a Shirley Temple of raspberry and lemonade was parked out out the front of the um of um the the um uh, oh, I'm just trying to remember what the name of the pub was in Mildura and um and you know I'm just sitting there quietly sipping on my raspberry and lemonade in the back of the ute and all of a sudden this sort of like flurry of activity comes out through the front door of the pub and um, it was the old man being thrown out because he'd, he'd overstepped the mark asking locals about where they thought the best place to catch a Murray cod was. <laughs> <laughs> 
you're, you're very humble, but your influence on Australia's seafood uh, history is incredible. Where did it all start for you? Where did, where, where did you get lured into the industry? <laughs> Yeah, look, it came about from um, from basically being penniless, uh, and in, after after a year of, of of you know sort of traveling around the world and working, being lucky enough to work in in Paris in, in fish markets and so forth, and a mate and I deciding that we um, might have a crack at, at at bringing this really unique scallop from South Australia from Coffin Bay, a bright purple shell and a bright purple row. And uh, uh, the, that was a hand-dived fishery from from Coffin Bay, and and you know, like harvesting in in the middle of winter there is you know it's a pretty you know sort of um, how should we say a unique experience. I mean, the water temperature is about eleven. Um, you know, sort of wearing in the wetsuit to keep warm is is um, you know, part of the part of the day's work. And then the the first harvest. Um, that we had was um, about 800 kilos, and I think the processor gave us about 100 bucks. And like that was not not didn't uh, didn't reflect um, a good investment of time, energy, or pain. Um, and the following day, we harvested about the same amount and and put them onto uh, harvest them um, and processed them onto the half shell. So this bright purple shell, bright purple row, beautiful, beautiful eating scallop, and you know flew to Sydney and. Ran around town and and found these guys like you know Tony Bilson and Steve Manfredi and Jenny Ferguson and and a young Neil Perry, and um, and they encouraged us. So we kept doing that and then started to move other product that some of our mates from Lincoln were catching: King George Whiting and Southern Calamari and some beautiful you know Spencer Golf Snapper and the Wild Kingfish. Um, and that was sort of that was the birth of the Flying Squid Brothers, um, which was um, which was a lot of fun. I mean, you know, it was the mid eighties. Um, Australians had woken up to food. I think you know the, the the days of the maroon velvet dinner jacket and tarantula bow tie and sole bon femme were sort of beginning to fade, and we sort of started to see all this. You know, uh, I know it's a hackneyed cliche, but all this produce driven food. Um, starting to hit plates and all these exciting young chefs that are, were that were um, really starting to have an influence on what Australians were eating, um, and you know, I know that you know there's been a lot of airtime given to to the story of Neil Perry, but I have to say that honestly, I mean, he has been such a champion for Australian producers and Australian food. Um, you know, what he has done over, I guess it's nearly four decades now, um, for food in this country is to, is to really give us the confidence to be who we are and, and what we do. And, and along with him, there were, there were others. I mean, you know, I was only, only talking to some, some chums the other day saying that, you know, the Bayswater Brasserie um, here in, 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 in King's Cross um, really defined um, what, Australians could do. I mean, it was operating breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week, and it would be not uncommon there on the Tuesday at nine o'clock to see two hundred people in the restaurant. Um, and and Tony Pappas is a is possibly a much unsung hero of the Australian food scene, and he was another, you know, su- huge supporter of the Flying Squid Brothers in terms of encouraging us to go out and and seek out you know different seafoods. D- seek out fishermen. I mean, you know, I, I, I was only laughing the other day um, when um, I was reading an old um, Baron Joey House menu that had had periwinkles on it, and I thought, God, I bloody ate more of those things than I sold because no one would buy them. But but we had this amazing fisherman out of St Helens in the in the northeast of Tassie. That was, you know, he also harvested the Vanarupus clam, um, which was just a really tasty, really meaty clam. Um, and he said, "Look, mate, can you help us out and do something with these periwinkles?" And we'd so we'd be madly trying to encourage, you know, all and sundry to eat them. Um, but you know, over the years, that's been the most exciting part of the job is is being able to engage with catchers and growers who really put their all into producing some amazing seafood, but often, 
you know, through the traditional, you know, transactional nature of the industry, their story gets lost on its way to market. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm pretty excited these days about the fact that, you know, any buyer is only two mouse clicks away from the source of supply effectively. Um, and so the greater the level of transparency in terms of that source of supply, the better it is for everyone. The, you know, it, it, it really does, it, it's transformational for everyone. If the fisherman knows what the cook is doing and the cook knows what the fisherman do, is doing and that they can actually engage in a dialogue to say, well, what if or how about or can we? Um, now, that just makes a huge, huge difference. And you know, as we're reflecting on how the quality of oysters has grown over the, over the last you know, 30 years that I've been you know, looking at them closely, so too has a lot of our fish handling. Um, you know, I remember Pete Jex from, from uh, Abacus Fisheries in Shark Bay. I mean, he first started double ickying, like head and tail spiking fish in 1986. And, you know, I think about the fact that the level of vision and foresight that Jexy had to be doing that at that time um, – really set the agenda for what fishermen in, in his region would go on to do. Um, the sad thing about that is that I reflect on the fact that the, the price of that snapper is pretty much the same as it was now, in, as it was in 1987. Um, and yet, you know, the cost of production has gone through the roof from both fuel and, and compliance and and freight and, and, and everything else. Um and I do tend to think that there's going to be a um, there's going to be a great awakening sooner than later. And I'm 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 seriously predicting that this is inside the next two quarters of 2022. Um, I mean, we've seen a massive reduction in quota in Queensland, the implementation of a quota system, and thus a massive reduction in in harvest capability here in New South Wales. Victoria is about to, on the first of March in 2022 will lose. Port Phillip Bay uh, as a wild capture fishery, aside from some small handline operators. Um, parts of Corio Bay, South Australia's had a reduction in quota, um, and Western Australia's going through a review. And, like, you know, we will, you know, absolutely be losing a, a big wedge of wild caught seafood in, in 2022 and 2023, um, which is going to make you know, I think that's going to be the, you know, come to Damascus moment for, for, for everyone um, about how special Australian seafood is and how we really need to be showing a hell of a lot more respect um, for, for, for everyone in the supply chain and for the seafood itself. At the top of the show, you mentioned lobsters as well, which are very popular during summer. You've got a hell of a lobster story from the early days when you were building your business. <laughs> There's a few huck actually, and I won't give you. The, I won't give you the one that you're referring to. Quite frankly, I'll give you another one because <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I no. We can reflect on that. I, I made an eye. In fact, it was it was the very genesis of the Flying Squid Brothers, where we'd 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 uh, we'd hire a Grumman aircraft from Parafield Airport in in Adelaide, um, fly to Coffin Bay, take the seats out, stuff the Grumman with literally wheat sacks full of cooked lobsters, fly to Alice Springs, hire a car at the airport, drive around to the pubs, flog these lobsters, get back into the plane, fly to port, fly back to Coffin Bay, put the seats back in the in the Grumman and fly back to Parafield to drop the plane off. And uh, it was it was a it was a great caper until um, until the owner of the Grumman uh, hit us with a bill to, to clean out the back, the back of the plane after we'd had a leakage one flight. <laughs> but no, I, in fact, there was another story about lobsters where um, we had a um, we had a particularly cranky restaurateur back in the late 80s um, and I'll never forget that he was absolutely bitterly upset um, about a level of service that he thought we hadn't provided um, on Christmas Eve and he uh, was a very well-known restaurateur and he used to get around town in a, in a flashy, albeit old, uh, yellow Rolls Royce. And uh, so one of the lads from the Flying Squid Brothers and I snuck down there on Christmas Eve and filled the hubcaps of this roller with uh, lobster shells and... <laughs> 
and by Australia Day, this restaurateur <laughs> had to sell the roller because he couldn't work out where the smell was coming from. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, but it was. I mean, look, the, those those grand old days were, were were pretty good. I relocated here to Sydney in uh, in eighty five, and um, you know we'd had we'd have the likes of again Neil Perry and Mark Armstrong and Tony Pappas and Greg Doyle, Pete Doyle, um, Michael McMahon, um, you know, all coming down to the markets. You know, every second day. To, to you know, not with a camera crew or a journalist in tow, but with um, you know, with a, a box to put their fish in and, and go back to the restaurant. And um, you know, it was not not to say that you know that, that that was better than what's what's around now, but I just you know, I think that it, it was you know that sort of that crossroads for the seafood industry that you know a, a group of chefs and restaurateurs you know managed to take the right turn and take the industry on that journey, which was fantastic. You've spent a career uh, connecting catchers and growers with chefs and communicating about seafood to just about anyone that will listen. But at this year, you joined the Deep in the Weeds Network with Fish Tales, a seafood podcast. Well, what's it been like uh, using new media like that and, and sharing messages? Well, look, it, it's been fantastic, Huck. I mean, you know, I've, I've certainly probably chewed your ear more than anyone on the planet's um, over the last, you know, 20 years in terms of regaling tales of the high seas. Um, and it was your encouragement to go down this path that has really sort of been, you know, that, that spawned the whole process. But I think it's a really exciting time in, in seafood and I think that the need and the opportunity to tell the stories and, and motivate and inspire um you know, listeners to understand that the seafood supply chain is really dynamic. I mean, it. I, I, I honestly think that it's not well recognised or regarded just how how dynamic it is. I mean, you know, terrestrial farmers, terrestrial growers um, don't face anywhere near the challenges of their, you know, marine counterparts in terms of, you know, what it takes to actually bring seafood to market. And, you know, if there's, if there's any sort of ambition that I have um, left in my career, it's to actually try and open those, those lines of communication to bring those stories to an audience that wants to know more. I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that, that chefs and restaurateurs and consumers want to know more about the source of supply, the provenance, the history, um, and, and, and the back catalogue story. And I think that, you know, the seafood industry have got so many really amazing and exciting stories to tell that uh, being given the opportunity to, to, to use Fishtails podcast is an absolute privilege. Um, and I just, you know, I hope that we can, we can tell that story, um, you know, going into next year, I, I'm really excited about bringing, you know, more stories around from, from around the world. And, you know, seafood is arguably one of the most, you know, global products um, in the food business, um, you know, yes, there's, you know, dairy has the exotic cheeses and, 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 you know, um, particularly pork can have some exotic, you know, hams and so forth. But I honestly think that, um, that seafood, uh, has, it is a global market and that's a reality. Um, you know, we're a 73% net importer of seafood in this country and, and, and I'm not against imports. I think that they're an important part of the, of the seafood landscape. And, you know, I think it's important that we can actually give mum the opportunity to feed the kids on a Tuesday night after school for, for, you know, sort of a, a modest spend. Um, and that's going to have to be an import. But I also think that we should be, you know, absolutely celebrating and, and recognizing how amazing our domestic Australian seafood is on a Saturday night. Um, and recognising that if we want to, if we want to tick every box from sustainability to culinary suitability or culinary excellence, and we need to be able to pay for it. Um, so, you know, my mission is definitely to try and open up those lines of communication and get those stories from, you know, from water to plate. It's a pretty frantic and busy time of year for those in the seafood industry and especially for you as well. But how are you going to uh, celebrate and what are you going to be cooking and eating this Christmas? Um, probably 4,000 light beers and a burnt turkey, but, uh, 
<laughs> that could be cause or effect. I'm not sure. No, um, <laughs> I think you know, I we do love we do love seafood um, in, in our household, and, and you know, there'll definitely be rock oysters. There'll definitely be some some um, some smoked and cured. There'll definitely be a whole fish um, because you know, being the bargain hunter that I am, I'll be seeing all these other buyers putting top dollar on crustacea and I'll be going for some, uh, you know, some, you know, co- maybe cold water New Zealand bass groper or harpooka, um, roasting it whole and then having, you know, what's left over between, you know, some white death and buttered sandwiches to watch the first ball of the Boxing Day test. <laughs> <laughs> and there might be a couple of Frosties involved as well. Well, um uh- John, as ever, it's uh, amazing to catch up with you and uh, look forward to seeing what you bring into the new year with uh, Fish Tales, a podcast uh, right here on the Deep in the Weeds Network. You're a bloody legend, mate. Hopefully we can catch up for those few frosties soon. Thanks, Huck. It's, you know, it's just such a pleasure to work with you and Rob. You're bloody legends yourselves. Cheers, mate. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we take a deep dive into the lives of the incredible people who ply their trade in the food and hospitality sector. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.